journey to Bethlehem, come and see. With Philip and the disciples, we were invited to come and see on November 15th. And we know if we want to come and want to see, we will. But we must first come. And come we have. Because if we do not come, we will never see. Each year, if we are willing to see anew, we are led to a new understanding of the heart, to the birth of the Messiah, God becoming one of us, the Incarnation. The Nativity of Christ is celebrated just at the time of the winter solstice, when the sun begins its ascent. Originally, it was a pagan feast honoring the god Cronus. December 25th was the first of the joyful feasts honoring the unconquered sun because the days get, begin to get longer and the sun radiates greater warmth. This day, the 25th, was regarded as the birthday of the sun and its triumph over the darkness of night. So what Christians did was rename the feast and put in the birth of Christ, who is the unconquered sun. The nativity can be called the mother of all feasts, for it includes all the other feasts and recalls for us every great event in the life of Christ, from his birth to Pentecost. The incarnation is also the birth of the icon. One of the most important roles played by icons and still continue to play in Christian history has been to proclaim the physical reality of Jesus Christ, God incarnate. He had and has a face. He had and has a body. He was born, lived, ate, taught, healed, died, and rose from the dead. Dostoevsky wrote, the world will be saved by beauty. And what could be more beautiful than the face of God? As someone said, we become what we look upon and what we see. Icon is a Greek word meaning image or likeness. The icon is based on the incarnation of Christ. His nativity marks the beginning, the birth of the icon. As Saint Theodore the Studite says, from the moment Christ is born of a mother who can be depicted, he naturally has an image which corresponds to his mother. Otherwise, how could we show a God no one has ever seen. Every icon speaks about God who became one of us so that we might be transfigured into the divine. Saint Irenaeus wrote this and it has been re-echoed down through the centuries. The icon is theology in color and image. As the fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council said, what the word says, the image shows us silently. What we have heard, we have seen. The icon is a window into the kingdom. It is a window or threshold that opens to the glory that has been promised us. It opens to us a window of connection with Christ and the community of saints. As it says in the book of Revelation, I saw a door open in heaven. The icon can be an entry into our own interior life, a passing through the narrow gate that leads to life. Like the gospel texts, the icon's aim is to transform the viewer. We were made in the image and likeness of God, but the image has been damaged and the likeness sometimes all but lost. 
The icon shows the recover, recovery of wholeness. The icon suggests the transfiguration that occurs to whoever has acquired the Holy Spirit. The icon is thus a witness to theosis or deification. The nativity icon is a celebration of the incarnation and the recreation of the world in Christ. And so now we begin the contemplation of the icon. It celebrates the reality of Christ's in, in, incarnation. We see the historical reality of the event in time, showing in its details the humanity of God with us. We see the angels, the kings, Joseph, the women bathing Jesus, the shepherds, the animals. We also see the recreation of the world in Christ. Through his incarnation, the world is transfigured and restored. Everything is reconciled in heaven and on earth. And so in the icon, you see it as purple. This should be a lovely red. This should be more purple. And the rest, the greens are quite obvious. The icon has beautiful rainbow colors because you know after a storm, when you see there's a rainbow in the sky and it's always a very joyful event. After the storm comes the beauty of the rainbow. So that is, is the re recreation of the world in Christ. The icon must be faithful to our world created by God. So we recognize there, we see humans, animals, vegetation, and land. But it also has to be faithful to the same God who is beyond all of this. Our own perspectives have to be changed when we look through that window. As we enter into the realms that the icon opens up, it is the leaving behind of the normal external world to the cosmos that is transfigured in the light of Christ. So nothing in our world can, can do better than hint at the beauty of the kingdom. So that is why natural objects are rendered in a symbolic, at times abstract manner. So you know they're cave, it's a cave, you know that they're mountains, you know that they're people and you know that they're trees, but they look different. The scene written in this icon occurs in front of the cave, never inside, to show that the, how the event itself goes beyond the actual historical moment. The icon leads us to discover the inner spiritual qualities of a person or event. Icons may seem flat, primitive, lacking in realism, but it is not intended to provoke an emotional response. There is a conscious avoidance of movement or gesture. The icon guards against over-familiarity with the divine, but it portrays both his humanity and divinity, his absolute demands on us, as well as his infinite mercy. So the icon is silent. Order, peace and joy fill the icon and it offers us a vision of the world to come. Humans, animals, landscapes and architecture all participate in the divine harmony. <clears throat> Theology and color and image. What the word says, the gospel, the image shows us silently. What we have heard, we have seen. The symbolism of color. The colors reflect the beauty of the rainbow. The reds, the purples, blues, greens, all very joyful. The choice of color is not just whatever the artist, the painter wants. 
the choice of color conforms generally to its symbolic meaning. The artist follows the canons of iconography. Gold is by itself because gold represents the divine, represents God. Only the solar gold symbolizes the center of divine life. Only God, brighter than the sun, emits this royal light. So we have the gold in this icon. We have it here. We have it showing on, on the halos. We have it here. It symbolizes light itself. And it symbolizes the uncreated light. Unlike even the light of the sun or the light in a room, it's uncreated. It is the light of the kingdom of God. The icon's light into white is the color of those who are penetrated by divine light. So you will often see Christ, especially the transfiguration or the resurrection in white. It is the color of revelation, of grace, of theophany. White is the sums up all the colors, but white is also a sign of the tomb and of death. Blue, the color of the heavens, is the sign of mystery of divine life, of God. And it is also the color of the robe of the Virgin. Red <clears throat> is near enough to light that it is sometimes used as the background for an icon. Here it isn't. It symbolizes divine love. It is the first among the colors because it's of its close link to the color of blood, the principle of life. It has an earthy, an earthy color of youth, beauty, health, and love. Yellow, on a level of radiance, is considered like red. Pure yellow represents truth. Purple is reserved for the highest of dignitaries, the supreme, symbol of supreme power of royalty. Green is a color that comes from the plant world and springtime. It is the color of the Holy Spirit in the, in, in the Eastern tradition. It's a symbol of spiritual regeneration. It symbolizes revival, new life, Pentecost. Brown, the color of the earth, the color of clay, of soil, it suggests autumn a symbol of poverty and humility. Black, the absence of color. In Genesis, the darkness and the chaos preceded creation. White represents unity. Black is its denial. It, can, it suggests chaos, despair and death, but also a transition leading to new life. So in, in the icon, only the cave is black. <clears throat> the heart of the mystery. Around Christ and his mother are grouped all the details which testify to the incarnation itself and its effect on the whole created world. The main event is moved to the foreground free of its surroundings, so the cave is placed behind it, rather than around Mary and her child. The mother of God, the Theotokos, is immediately beside the child, yet outside the cave, for she has never dwelt in the dark regions of sin, for she was without sin. And in Byzantine liturgy, she is the holy mountain from whom Christ will emerge. Eve became the mother of all the living. In the new Eve, we have the mother of the redeemed. 
She is the largest figure in the icon because in icons, proportions are usually ignored and they often don't correspond to the height of human figures figure, figured in it. So the most important person will be the largest. She is half sitting, supported by a hammock, a bed, hammock bed in front of the cave, um, a, probably a birthing bed. Sometimes or very often, this is a, a color of purple, speaking of her royalty. Here it's white with, you can see the gold coming through, symbol of the divinity. And she has a purple Maphorian. It's the color of royalty, the symbol of her humanity. And a blue robe, symbol of the divine. She is the creature who bore the son of God in her womb. She has three stars, one on her forehead and on her shoulders to indicate her virginity before, during and after the birth of Christ. And she has a gold halo symbolizing the, her holiness. And beside her in Greek are the letters mother of God or Theotokos. In, in the Nativity Island <clears throat> icon, she may be looking at the child. She sometimes is looking out at the world. And it, but at this, in this one, she's looking at Joseph, symbolizing a compassionate attitude toward human unbelief and doubt because poor Joseph didn't exactly know what to make of it at the beginning. The Christ child, his state was divine, yet he did not cling to his equality with God, but emptied himself to assume the condition of a slave and become as we are. His complete abasement of becoming one of us. <clears throat> he is dressed in white swaddling clothes and his abasement is also shown by the fact he was born in a cave and born in a manger. And we notice in his, his swaddling clothes, the gold shining through his garment, to showing that he is higher than kings. He has a cruciform halo. So whenever we see this halo in any icon, we know that it's Christ. He is truly the light of the world and the cross shows what he will, will happen in the future. He gave himself for the life of the world. And in the center, Wuan, representing words that Moses heard before the burning bush and God revealed his name. I am he who is. And beside him are the letters in Greek, Jesus Christ. Jesus, his name is a human and Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. <clears throat> his cradle prefigures a tomb. And the, the icon links birth and death. We bear our death within us from the moment of birth. The icon of the nativity says the same. Our life is one piece and its length of much less importance than its purity and its truthfulness. The cave is, represents the world of sin, darkness, despair, hopelessness. The darkest night of the year. The Christ child is in the cave because the son of, he is the son of truth who has entered history and he has come to be with us in our darkness. As John says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overpower it. 
but Christ's birth is not only for us, but for all creation. The ox and the ass offer him their breath of life. They speak of innocence and loyalty, but they also represent all creatures endangered, exploited by humans. They too are victims of the fall, as is all creation. The prophetic role, which is the top role, the star, representing the Trinity, the ray of light focuses our, our attention on the birth of Jesus and that he is the light. Sometimes there are three stars, but we have the Father, the Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit is shining. They are shining down on the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Our Savior, the day spring from on high, has visited us. And we who are in the shadow and in darkness have found the truth. Then we have the mandorla, that's this arc up at the top. The mandorla or nimbus is a symbol in the shape of a circle or could be almond shaped and it signifies heaven, the divine glory or light. With it, the glorified body of Christ is depicted beyond the earthly plane of being. So this is this is God, it's, and it signifies heaven, divine glory, or light, and it only shines around Jesus, the Lord. The angels. The angels, some of them are adoring, and on the right, an angel is announcing the news to the shepherds. The shepherds. They listen, some of them are listening to the words of the, the angel, and another shepherd is playing. They are simple men, and throughout history, it has been the simple people who have been the most open to receiving the message of the gospel. They are the ones who have been summoned to hear the choir of angels singing and to announce the birth of the Messiah. And they also represent the Jewish people. The Magi. The close attention to the stars made them come on pilgrimage in order to pay homage to a king who belongs to not one people, but to all people. Not to one age, but to all ages. They represent the world beyond Judaism. They have traveled a long journey. And when you look closely at them, they are of different ages because each one of us has our own spiritual journey. And the journey from the head to the heart is not dependent on how old or young we are. The human role, the bottom. Saint Joseph. He is separated because he's not the father. And he is shown beset with doubts. Whose child is this? It represents all those who ask, how can this be possible? And before him stands an old humpback shepherd, a tempter in the guise of an old shepherd. How can this be? A virgin birth is just not possible. A miracle? Surely you aren't foolish enough to believe Mary conceived this child without a human father. If not you, then who? The midwives. They're busy with the work that has to be done at every birth. The child is human. The child is born and is a newborn like every other child. So he is bathed. And there is a, 
symbolism, which, which you can pull out of the later on baptism, the baptismal font and uh, the chalice, but to show that he is also human is what they are there for. The tree, the symbol of the tree of Jesse, but a shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse and from his roots a bud shall blossom. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The cosmos, symbolized by rocks, plants, and earth. The lower green, the center reddish, this is red, remember, and the upper blue and purple, more heavenly. But we don't forget when we are looking at this icon, the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. His birth occurred where it did because there was no room in the inn. He who welcomes all is himself unwelcome. He reveals himself in poverty and vulnerability. If we turn our backs on the homeless and the poor, become obsessed with consumerism, plunder earth, deny the primacy of the human person, we will end up being resentful, angry, listless, deadened in spirit, and find ourselves lost in the icon starless cave. But he is there to receive and save us. The icon reminds us that no one and nothing is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. We are all invited to come, see, be forgiven, and start anew. As Zephaniah says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives you the victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on the day of festival. God is with us, Znameboch.